On the bill as video entertainers, tonight at seven, Prelude, an American soul singer, Gloria Gaynor. Now, a sense of place. Tonight, Ken Martin continues his architectural tour with a look at some of the symbolic buildings of Liverpool, including the Catholic and Anglican cathedrals, the jelly and the lamp. obviously the liver building. There's enough material in that jelly for a whole lecture on architecture. The nature of form, the, the way in which the material behaves, the way in which it moves, its shape, its colour, the feel of it, what it tastes like, the whole thing. Now that interesting building up there is in fact a jelly and this is a building. And the reason I'm saying this is it's the power of the symbol. If I took this jelly anywhere in the world, New York, Sydney, Timbuktu, there'd be people who'd know it was the liver building. And it's because of its form, and the way in which it's individual. These silly mm -hmm. clock towers, which don't really do a thing except hold up those splendid birds and have a clock that's six inches bigger than Big Ben. An Edwardian insurance building, very confident, without its towers, really just a rectangular box. Beautifully restored inside recently, and one of Liverpool's main symbols. Liverpool has about 10 of them, and if you took 10 of them away, it wouldn't be Liverpool anymore. Now, Pierhead has a number of them, actually. We've got the uh, Cunard building there, which today has the tricolour on top, which when you look at the detail, around the frieze are the arms of the Allies in the First World War. And there's all sorts of richness and detail. And the final one is the Mersey Docks and Harbour Board building there with its dome, which is in fact big enough to put Liverpool Town Hall inside. Amazing symbolism. The dock board was telling Liverpool Corporation that it, it really owned the river. It doesn't anymore, by the way. We have other people that do now, like the Merseyside Development Corporation. Everything changes, but the symbols are still there. And the symbols are what people enjoy and, and know. And without them, cities would be flat and boring and really a lot less interesting. We did enjoy making this jelly. Oh, and I've got some strawberries because we've had fantastic weather making this particular program. And we're going to put strawberries around this. A summer fruit. This is an advert for the British Strawberry Growing Association, but never mind. And I'm going to put two strawberries on top, I hope. I've got some cream as well, and we're going to really enjoy eating these. Some around the back too. And the thing to remember is it's those birds on top of the building that make it what it is. They're the symbol. The whole building is just to, to hold those two birds up. A fantastic Edwardian romp, a real piece of architecture. This is the Catholic Cathedral in Liverpool, the second cathedral to be built in the 20th century in this city. A remarkable achievement. And I'm happy standing here in the sun. And I'm not very happy about some of the details on the outside of this building. It's a fine cathedral, splendid interior, but the outside does seem to have some problems. The weathering on the chapels here at the side is rather unfortunate, and I would have been much happier if it had been in brick, much easier material in the way it mellows, much more a material that's to do with Liverpool. And I'm very concerned at the way things like the mosaic here on the main structural elements is not being maintained adequately. It's a problem when you specify materials like this because if they're not very well done, the frost, little Jack Frost, is going to get inside these and these are going to be falling off next winter or the winter after. And it's rather sad because cathedrals should be expensive buildings. The organ in the uh, Anglican Cathedral is insured for three millions. This building only costs four millions, so the contrast is amazing. If an organ in one building is the cost of another cathedral, either the organ's too expensive, and I don't think it is because organs should be that good in one place in the country, and this building should have either cost twice as much or been half the size. And if it was half the size, it could have had still a fine interior because the interior is really good. It functions extremely well in a liturgical sense, but the outside is too complex. There's too many bits the weather that can get at. There's inadequate kind of detail. Perhaps the workmanship wasn't good enough for the, for the cost. And finally, this is a building that's going to cost money to repair. But then all buildings cost money to repair, and it's no good blaming architects all the time, which is what the public tends to do. They should examine their own motives, look at the size of the purse, and decide how much they can have for the money they can spend. 
and perhaps we should be building fewer, better buildings. Because although this is a good building, the outside of it does leave something to be, well, improved on. But let's go inside, because that's really the better part of the building. After making the jelly mould, I had a dream. A dream came out of this. And if it bears any resemblance to something that you've seen before, don't be surprised. From this, we in fact made this model. And the model looks a bit like a turbine. It looks mechanical and functional. These represent the ribs that are the outside of the cathedral. Here are the side chapels. And the whole thing is a centralized plan with the emphasis on the altar in the, in the middle of the building. Splendid. Here are the entrances and the chapel at the rear. And the delightful bit, the bit that really makes it fly, is the crown of thorns and the whole of the stained glass, magnificent center space. And of course, what we've got is a little light inside. And the idea in the dream was that children's bedrooms should have these inside, so they could just occasionally put the light on and off if they really wanted to. It's a beautiful tower that in fact makes the whole building take off, go up to the heavens, and completes the whole glory of the interior. The light changes as it goes round. This doesn't rotate, actually. If the whole thing could rotate, that would be even better. But in fact, on a sunny day, during the day, the building changes colour as the sun moves round, absolutely as it should. And three times in the year, they in fact light the interior. It costs a lot of money to do it, but they do it at Easter, Christmas, and on Lamp Sunday. And when you're driving round or walking around Liverpool, you suddenly see the lantern fully lit, and it's absolutely superb. A terrific interior. Behind me is the altar, and above the altar is the baldacchino, which is the scaffolding-like structure, which consists of a canopy. Looks as though it was made at camel layers, but that doesn't matter because the whole building is functional in intent. And it, it, in fact, holds the public address system and the lighting, and it concentrates attention down on the altar, which is white marble from Yugoslavia with a very small crucifix by Elizabeth Frink. Small because the liturgy thinks they should be smaller these days to not draw too much attention to them. And the whole building works well. Centralised plan, seats all the way around, lovely materials on the floor, splendid marble floor and pine seats in a circle, concentrating the attention on the altar. An absolute delight. Now, the really enjoyable thing for me is that the more often I've been to visit this building, the more often I've been pleased at the way in which it's becoming more colourful, because they're now hanging tapestries on the walls, the chapels are becoming enriched with sculpture, things are beginning to happen in the chapels that, to begin with, weren't there. In fact, the whole cathedral is achieving this patina, this kind of warmth that comes with time. The building's being used, it's being valued, it's being enriched by, by time, and that, that's really quite splendid. It's a wonderful, colourful interior, a fine modern building. The 1926 design for Liverpool's Catholic Cathedral would have rivaled St Peter's in scale and might have moved the centre of gravity of the Catholic Church. The new cathedral is built on the crypt, which is the only part of the original design that was built. This is colonial architecture. The whole of the imagery, the symbolism is about authority, dignity, weight, mass, Lutyens, who was the architect for the original design, was in fact the architect for New Delhi. What we've got here is granite, undecorated, strong, determined, authoritative, challenging occasion. Look at the banana-shaped lintel there, where in fact what he's doing is inverting the, the laws of architecture. It's a very willful, strong, very personal sort of architecture, this. I'm not sure I like it. I mean, this is a mere fragment. If the whole building would have been like this, it would have been far, far too massive and too heavy. But it's interesting. And where I'm standing now, in fact, is part of a, what could be a natural amphitheatre. It's very depressing at present. We have a bit of a substation with some rather boring steps, with the ends of the, of the old plinth here. And what we've got is an opportunity to open this up, if we want to be positive, rethink all these steps, and I'd be standing in the middle of a stage, because this is theatre again. The whole thing is, is about dynamism and, 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 well, vigor. And this is dreadful, really, it's quite disappointing. 
We should rethink things like this because time, the one advantage of time in buildings is you can change the building. It doesn't have to stay exactly the same forever. I mean, we can carry on improving things and this is a completely lost opportunity. Well, let's go inside. There's something I want to show you in here. This is Phantom of the Opera. What sort of fantasies did Lutyens have when he was designing this building in the 1930s? I mean, here we are coming out of living rock under the cathedral now. And there are these amazing spaces, these private spaces in buildings that usually only the builders and the architects know about. And there are some interesting things. Look at this one over here. It's hard work. Listen to the creak. Easy, even. Lovely rhythm. This is the crypt. The foundation stone was laid on Whit Monday, June the 5th, 1933, and it took 25 years before they opened it. Six and a half million bricks, 32,000 square feet. And in fact, it's only about one hundredth of the volume of the building that was proposed. I'm guessing at a hundredth. It's amazing. Byzantine in feeling, quite mysterious, strong. These, these brick vaults that went all the way through and the building would have sat on top of it. A splendid religious space. Look at the wonderful altar at the end there with the, the crucifix and the six candles, and they're real candles. It's very peaceful, very quiet, a very religious building. It's bloody marvelous. It's one of the most magnificent buildings in the world. Liverpool's Anglican Cathedral, designed by a Catholic, soaring, proud, majestic. working here nearly 49 years. Uh, Sir Giles Scott sent for me in 1934 to take charge of the carving here, wood and stone. I've been here relatively ever since, apart from war service. And, uh, I've enjoyed every moment of it. But this is the west front that I'm working on the last feature to be completed, should we get sufficient uh, money or a grant from some kind person. Uh, and then I should be off to New York to continue working on uh, St. John the Divine. I would, I'm back from there about five weeks ago. They've offered me a 15-year contract there. I'm 18 next year. I'm at the back of the cathedral now, and all this junk, these old gravestones, really need tidying up. It's a, it's a bit disappointing, a bit of a letdown. But what we've got here is a model of the cathedral, and what I want to do is use the model to show you something that might have happened with the cathedral. The interesting thing this model shows is this is the cathedral more or less as built with the amended West End. This was, in fact, a cheaper version of the original design. Remember, this was a competition winner. And the original design by Sir Giles Gilbert Scott 
was for twin towers on the end with a port cochere, that's a fancy name, a French word, for a port so you could drive your car or your carriage through, which in fact had a spiral staircase, rather like the helmet on a, on a Norse helmet that would go down over the nose, that went down into a ravine. And at the bottom of that stair was to be his grave. A fantastic pivot, like a nail at the end of the cathedral, holding the whole thing together. And in fact, it would have been even more magnificent with this particular West End. It's sad it wasn't built, and in fact, all old buildings have things like this in the history. You find that the symbolism changes, that the buildings are never built as they're designed. Things change and alter. Sometimes we get less than we might have done, and it would have been an even better building with this West Front. The Adventures of Ken Martin, Architect. Episode 3, The Flying Cathedral. This, of course, is pure Basil Rathbone, straight out of Robin Hood, a piece of architectural theatre, ecclesiastical theatre. I'm 60 feet up on a bridge in the middle of a nave, just under the tower, disappearing into, into darkness with ribs and vaulting and, and stained glass windows and, and timber detailing and oak and all the stones individually designed by the architect. A sp splendid building, truly magnificent cathedral. And, of course, this was a stonemason's cathedral, truly enjoyed by the people that built it and the people that, that designed it and, and a tribute to everything they've achieved. 75 years to build, probably the last building of its kind, the last stone cathedral. This is an angling story. It's like the fish, the big one that got away. It is, in fact, an idea that didn't succeed, but it was a very good try. The cathedral sits uh, on the hill in front of a, a fine open space at present, which some people wanted to be a park. But recently there was a housing competition, and the competition was for a single developer with a single architect for a single use. That's housing on the whole of the site. And a group of us, nine architectural practices in Liverpool, thought it would be a good idea to, in fact, put forward an alternative. And the alternative, in fact, brought together 18 different developers and provided 18 different uses for this site. And we made an entry. We made a model to display the scheme, which we weren't allowed to put in the cathedral as part of the competition, despite the fact the cathedral is enormous. 
And the scheme, in fact, had a lovely variety in it. Each architect brought different ideas and different clients, and they ranged from a Chinese cinema and sports center with a pagoda restaurant, to a private hospital at the end of Rodney Street, to housing association work, private houses for sale, houses and offices, offices, a viewing platform, single person housing, a tea room, shops, a Salvation Army hostel, a cooperative housing thing, a pub, a supermarket, three shops, single person housing at the end, and another uh, shared housing scheme right at the south end there. It was a lovely mixture. Anyway, Heseltine didn't want to give us the chance to try this new initiative, and the four judges, whose names we've all forgotten, actually turned the light out on what was really a very interesting idea. <laughs> 